O Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. Kind of an irony that uh, we focus today on James's letter to the Ephesians, talking so much about the power of the tongue, and I, I barely have a voice to use my own. But I thank you for bearing with me. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I think we can add preaching and punditry to James's truism, because after all, they, they are all of a piece. In each case, the speaker is trying to elucidate a, a concept or a perceived truth or to challenge an audience uh, to reconsider uh, its own assumptions. And that was true for Jesus as well. And as one who was fully human in his divinity, even he had moments where his ability to communicate a truth ran up against the limitations of his disciples and his own humanity. Hence, we have his famous invective from today's gospel, Get behind me, Satan. How effective do you imagine that uh, outburst was at opening Peter's mind, much less the other disciples? The scriptures show that it wasn't one of Jesus' most effective pedagogical moments. When you consider the, the qualities that go into good teaching and preaching, what are they? Just throw out a couple for me, please. Clarity. Patience. Patience. Irony. Irony. So it's a sense of humor. That's all right. Sense of humor, yes. Anybody else? Honesty. Honesty. Yeah. Perhaps um, creative adaptability, patience, enthusiasm, respectfulness, and I think also most, one of the most important ones, curiosity, openness, right? The ability to be fully present with your audience. And with such a mountain of skill sets, it's a humbling and terrifying responsibility at times to teach or to preach. So I sort of feel like sitting down right now. Think of it. Most weeks, I'm expected to write and present to this congregation sermons that are supposed to lift up, to edify, unify, uh, heal, inspire provoke goodness or thoughtfulness, and, and what's more, foster a deeper connection with the divine. And that's a tall order. And while I've probably failed at that more times than I care to admit, there's nothing more exciting than when someone responds with insights or, or commentary or challenges that not only challenge my own thinking or help me reconsider an assumption or how I articulated a point or an idea. But of course, that's not always comfortable. <laughs> One of the things that I miss most about Susan Goff since her passing a year ago last June was not just her incredible sense of humor. I mean, anyone who knew her can tell you that she was a very funny lady. But rather, for me, it was her sincere and loving commitment to challenging me when something didn't sit right with her. If she heard something in a sermon or a vestry meeting with which she disagreed strongly, she would always let me know. But she always did it or, she, or rather, she never did it in an accusatory or a belligerent way. 
It was never designed to score a point. She stated her understanding of the issue at hand, which, or whatever she thought she heard, and explained why it bothered her. And then she was always open and appreciative of a measured and thoughtful response. And most of the disagreement never impinged on her love for me or for this church. And that's the way it should be with all of us. In an opinion piece in the Washington Post yesterday, which I highly recommend you read, Stanford psychologists Jamil Zaki and Luisa Santos, they describe how just such a dynamic may be the key to bridging the religious and political divides plaguing our current national zeitgeist. They describe how our current pessimism and, and perception of irreconcilability often leads us into conversations ready for combat, right? Assuming that our divisions are so deep and that the other is somehow so unrelatable that even though that's not true, the sad irony is that even when our pessimism is misplaced, it creates cycles of silence and misunderstanding that worsen division. But most of our basic human needs, our concerns and our, our joys are the same. What we need and hunger for is to be heard and understood. And given the right cognitive behavioral tools and training, we can help heal those divisions in much the same way as we can heal depressions by creating a more accurate and intimate feedback loop rooted in the reality of their community and their commonality. But of course, Zaki and Santos also point out that we are challenged in particular at this moment in time by the presence of political and media conflict entrepreneurs, you know, who feed us terrifying depictions of our rivals as bloodthirsty monsters who want to burn our nation to the ground, or cable news and social media platforms that are so siloed that they promote systematically biased information warping our perceptions of the other. And that's why I, I think that James, whose epistle we've been reading these past weeks, has to be one of our most important practical theologians in the Christian canon of Scripture. I'd actually assert he's even one of my favorites. He, he got a bum rap in the early Reformation. Martin Luther asserted that James wrote an epistle of straw because he, of what he perceived as James's penchant for preaching works righteousness instead of justification by faith alone. But I'd assert that we have more to learn, especially in our day and age, from James and his examination of the power of speech than from any other epistle. In fact, according to Robert uh, Krushvich of the Center for Christian Ethics at Baylor University, 43% of the verses in James's epistle are related to matters of speech. Now, I believe deeply more than ever that our tongues, the corporal, uh, uh, the, the corporal metaphor for the power of speech are truly the most important, if not the physically most powerful muscles in our bodies. I once heard that the, the tongue was the strongest muscle in the body, so I, I googled it to, to be sure of the, its veracity, and I discovered in Scientific American that it was a common misconception that the jaw muscles, actually pounds per square inch, are the most powerful muscles we have. But there was something else I learned about the tongue that I found particularly interesting and, and fascinating. The tongue is not one muscle, but a mesh of eight muscles that must work in coordination. And they're free of any bones, so they're almost always at work.
keeping or changing shape. And hence, they're extraordinarily malleable and flexible and have much more, uh, as much endurance as our most active muscle, you know, the heart. Of course, the danger of that endurance is that unfortunately we've become far too adept at letting them run on <laughs> without enough forethought. Rather than bridle our tongues, we say what is ever on our minds in the moment, and then too often the damage is extensive. Our speech often shapes or precludes our thought, right? Rather than the other way around, we say something stupid, and then we play the mental gymnastics to justify our outbursts because we become so afraid of losing face that we, we lose our integrity, our respect, our community, and sometimes even friendships. Now, sometimes we don't say what's on our minds. We use our tongues to deceive, to justify or excuse or manipulate. I mean, think of the euphemisms and verbal gymnastics that so many of us, especially those people with power, use to disguise naked self-interest or brutality or narrow-mindedness or indifference. We find all ways of couching things, and we think we're concealing our true intent. But our greatest hope lies in the truth that our tongues are indeed very flexible and can be trained to behave in the most creative and life-giving ways. And Jesus is our primary model for that. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And He heals with simple proclamation, you know, he, pronouncing forgiveness and facilitating inclusion. He drives out evil by saying so. Yes, Jesus castigates Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan, and that sounds kind of harsh at first, considering especially that Peter was Jesus' right-hand man. But Jesus is, is desperate to lay bare for us, as well as Peter, his misunderstanding of what the Messiah is all about. Not to humiliate, but to set him and us free. Because as a Jew of his day, Peter misunderstood the Messiah to be a political savior not a, a spiritual guru or the, the next leader, but the Messiah, as Jesus incarnated him, was not one who uses the world's values and, and vocabulary of might and military to achieve one's ends. Jesus was saying, listen to the truth. Listen not to human truth, but divine truth, the truth of love and inclusion. And the only truly lasting power is that power of self-giving. So take up your cross and follow me, which didn't make him very popular. Now, for some amazing reason, we choose to be Christ followers today, despite it being the most challenging calling on the planet. And it's my hope and my, my call to align my tongue with his call, to proclaim peace, to witness justice, to comfort the lowly, to lift up truth, to sing the joy of salvation, to promise forgiveness to humbled hearts. You know, our tongues are a community of muscles that must work together to that end. Otherwise, articulating the good news is impossible. We need each other. Now, we may not all be preachers and teachers, but no one is dispensable. 
I know I need this community of accountability so that when my tongue is untamed and when it is inartful or inflammatory or ignorant or thoughtless that I'm not merely judged but guided back into the course of love. See, we, we need the dexterity of all our tongue muscles to maintain Christ's flexible and indefatigable message of hope. So in this, as in all things, Lord, your will be done. Amen.